Eamon de Valera has just discovered the Irish delegation has signed a treaty with the British in London without consulting him. He confronts Griffith, Collins and the rest on their return to Dublin. I've, I've just read this morning's papers. There's a copy of this, this treaty on the front pages. What's going on here? Arthur? We signed an agreement, a memorandum of agreement, not a treaty mind with them. It will have to be approved by the Doyle and House of Commons. Approved be damned. This, this capitulation will not be put before the Doyle nor the Irish people. If it sees the light of day, we will be lynched. Why wasn't I consulted on this? Damn it! Why did you go sleeveening behind my back and sign this, this abomination? We had no choice, Chief. They threatened to scorch the earth. All out war. Worse than before. And you sent us over there as plenipotentiaries. Your words, Chief. We acted as we saw fit. It was the best that could be achieved in the circumstances. They threatened you like they always threatened us, and you fell for it. They called your bluff, and you choked. You. Barton, you signed this, this thing? Only under protest. You see... He signed of his own free will. We all did. And Childers... Surely not you. I didn't sign, yay or nay. I was sent as a lonely scribe and was treated like a dog by both sides. Why, you English... You're only a... I was was dismissed from the room. I was dismissed from the room. Just as well, actually, as my stomach turned with the way they cowed towards the British... Let him speak, gentlemen. Ah, yes... For the first time, my voice will be heard. All right, get on with it, man. Quite. The truth is, Churchill, Lloyd George and Birkenhead could hardly control their mirth, Chief. What I witnessed over there was a travesty. The wily wench fox did get out of second gear. In the end, they got bored with it. Churchill was anxious to go grouse shooting in Scotland. And they brought things to a head with threats of war. And your... your plenty potentiaries... Buckled and ignored. Oh, oh, yes, it's coming to me now. Birkin had an appointment with his tailor or some such thing. Oh, oh, dear. Oh, dear. Look, you are always no good, Childers. You slippy double agent. At least I observed. I took stock, man. Not like your good self, Mikko, traipsing through Mayfair like a puffed up peacock. While Churchill and his spies choreographed your every move? Oh, I'll have you on this spy. Maybe not today, by God, I'll have you. And that wasn't the worst of it, Deb. While Mikko here was touring the flesh pots, Arthur here, your Arthur, this fine, steady, solid fellow, was colluding with the Prime Minister himself. He went as native as that Indian headdress they made you wear in the States last year. Out with it, man. Out with it. What is it? It's this, Dev. Here it is. You want an agreement or treaty? I'll give you a treaty. Didn't the bold Arthur here enter into his own pact with Lloyd George? Why, you dirty English sleepy... What pact? Tell me what pact. Didn't he give an undertaking to Lloyd George that if partition, partition, mind you, was the only outstanding block to a treaty, then he would concede it? A tissue of lies. I criminal libel. You're lower than a snake's belly, man. Think so, my dear solid Arthur. You really think so? So riddle me this, old man. Why was petition never discussed? And why then it is now enshrined in this treacherous document? And why did you sign first? You want a report, Chief? You want your humble secretary's report? Well, then here it is. These plenipotentiaries, this shower of bumbling, incompetent peasants, duck-dived, avoided and manipulated their way through these negotiations. The elephant in the room, partition, partition, wasn't even discussed. And thanks to good old Arthur here, it was politely stepped over and then inserted quietly into the agreement. Don't get me wrong, Chief, there was plenty of what you country chaps call shite talk about the oath of allegiance, the oath mind, nothing about the sovereignty of our nation, nothing about the end of the dream of a united Ireland, Partition, nothing about partition. Partition was inserted into the treaty without a whimper. All right, men, let him finish. Let let him finish, men, let him finish. Thank you, Chief. But I will finish with this. I blame you, Chief, most of all. 
not because of your constant interfering, your subterranean conniving with the Welshman, not because of your cloak and dagger Machiavellian manoeuvres, but because of this one is inescapable fact. You sent the shower over there to represent our nation, and you elected not to go. And now, gentlemen, if you don't mind, I have tendered my report, and I bid you adieu. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Good morning, morning Prime Minister. Minister. Well, chaps, I've just come from the palace. His Majesty has given his imprimatur to this treaty with the Irish. Needless to say, Craig Avon and his lot in Ulster are very pleased indeed. They have their unionist statelet. Or is it province? Yes, province sounds better. The ancient province of Ulster. It has a nice ring to it. Don't forget, Prime Minister, that the province of Ulster also includes uh, Monaghan, Cavan and Donegal. Yes, yes. Minor details, my dear Winston, to be ironed out at the Boundary Commission. But but will Collins, Griffith and, and the others convince De Valera and, and indeed the Irish people to, to accept this split? What about their dream of a united Ireland? My dear Birkenhead, I fear we will have war whichever way it turns. As I see it, there are three possibilities. One... We give them their united Ireland, and we have a civil war between unionists and nationalists. Two, the treaty fails, and we revert back to an even bloodier war with Corland and De Valera as before. And, um, three? The least of the three evils. The best we can hope for is for this treaty to be narrowly carried. If that be the case, civil war in Southern Ireland is certain. However, neither we or our unionist friends are in the picture. If the nationalists wish to slaughter each other, so be it. We have done our best, given circumstances. You mean uh, we have washed our hands of the matter, Prime Minister? Maybe so, but it is vital we support the two new regimes, both unionist and nationalist. We need stability in our backyard. And what of our soldiers in Southern Ireland? All the main dailies in Dublin and indeed London carry the story on their front pages. Good man. Now, the Foreign Office needs to put the squeeze on the United States and the Dominions to back the treaty as a great breakthrough. The end of 700 years of conflict, and so on. We have given them a separate parliament and retained the link with Westminster. We need to keep an eye on the ball, as it were. I, my dear Winston, have no intention of taking my eye off the ball, as you put it. However, I need an experienced pair of eyes for the job. A wily character who has the skills to oversee a delicate situation. A diplomat. Someone of wise counsel. A consummate negotiator. An enforcer. A... <coughs> I beg your pardon, Winston, old chap, but had you anyone in mind for the job? Uh, well, Prime Minister, uh, far be it from me to put myself forward, but... What a splendid proposal. Well, that's settled then. Are uh, we all agreed that Winston here will take charge of matters in Ireland from here on in? Uh, agreed, Prime, Prime Minister. Minister. Good, good. Well, that settles it then. Now, can we move on, gentlemen, to these disconcerting reports from Germany about this beer hall puts? Let me speak. Would you let me speak? I said let me speak. I said let him speak. I said let Michael speak. Fellow Cabinet colleagues, I lay before you today a document that at first sight is unacceptable, nay, impossible. But it's the best deal we could get without the annihilation of our nation. I, more than anyone around this table, know that we are an exhausted force. The army is on its knees. The countryside is in ruins. Our people cry out for peace and stability. But not for object surrender, Mick. Pierce wouldn't sign this. Farce, nor Emmet, nor Tone. They are all well dead, Cahill. We've moved on. The fact is that neither Pierce, nor Tone, nor Emmet came close to what we have achieved. The very stepping stones to complete our freedom. Sure, there are shackles in this treaty, but over time we can loosen them and in the end cast them aside. Don't you see? It's freedom to achieve freedom. It's an end to the slaughter, bloodshed and conflict. I ran this wretched war on your behalf. Allow me now to end it. The chief here, our president, may oppose this agreement, but he is the very man equipped to decouple us from the English bit by bit. 
I will never know the reasons why he chose not to head up the talks in London, but I can, hand on heart, tell you this. It is the very best we could have hoped for. In time, we will have our full freedom. But for now, let's adopt this treaty. Recommend it to the Irish people and move on. Cahill, Cahill. Thank you, Chief. Colleagues, Mr. Collins here has no difficulty in bending his knee in allegiance to his Britannic Majesty. No difficulty in accepting dominion. Yes, dominion status on behalf of the Irish nation. No difficulty with the British Navy destroyers steaming into Loxwilly or the Cove of Cork. Maybe we will secure the changes he seeks, but not in my lifetime and over my dead body. We will never, I say never, get back to North East if we give it away now. We have been duped, comrades. Look around you. Do you really think for one moment that that new monstrosity instalment is a temporary measure? What in the name of God have we achieved? What was our gallant struggle all about then? You fine gentlemen have plucked the Home Rule Act from the shelf and severed the best of it, Ulster, from our grasp. That, Cahill, is why we insisted on the inclusion of a boundary commission that will determine the borders of each jurisdiction. That, my dear Arthur, is the biggest ruse of all. You've said it yourself, man. You have conceded partition already. This boundary or border has already been drawn. Two separate states now already exist. Monaghan and Tyrone are in different countries. Tyrone and Tyrconnell are in different countries. The Boundary Commission, as you like to call it, was designed by Lloyd George to take the heat out of things. It puts matters on the long finger, at least until the new statelets can bed in and become more permanent. Then it won't matter a damn. A stroke of genius. Childers here is right. He hooked you good and proper. That, Chief, is only supposition. We will have a nominee in the commission with an independent sure, chairman. Sure, Michael, some anglophile judge from the Dominions who won't want to rock the boat and preserve the status quo. In short, they say they want all of Ulster, including Cavan, Monaghan and Donegal. We say we want everything west of the ban. Neither of us really expect to achieve our goals and the status quo is maintained. Childers... You seem to know what's in their mind. Uh, yeah, what say uh, you? Well, Ahanin Kiro Kiro Gela. Michael, stop these personalised attacks. I was there in Hoth when this Englishman and two girls sailed through the British Navy with a little ship stuffed to the gunnels with arms. Arms that you and I were happy to use during the rising. Now in God's name let him speak, please. Ach, Sosnok Michael, please. Let him rant on, Chief. Let them all rent on. The fact is, we will get no more. We vote on the agreement we have on the table and give the Doyle and the Irish people our recommendation. I, for one, am against. Silence! Silence, all of you. If we, if we are all finished, I will now formally put these articles of agreement to the Cabinet. Carl, you first. No. Michael? Yes. Austin? No. Arthur? Yes. Robert? Yes. Liam? Yes. What? I said yes, man. Damn it. Yes. I, as president, will cast my vote against this treaty and will recommend to the Doyle accordingly. You will not, sir. I, I beg your pardon, Liam. You, sir, as head of this cabinet, will convey to the Doyle the cabinet support for these articles of agreement. You're the mathematician. Do the sums, man. The motion has been carried by four votes to three. So, so what turned you, Liam? You fought with Carl here side by side in the South Dublin Union. I thought you could always be relied on, man. Well, not any more, my dear chief. You've taken me for a, what was your words? Ah, yes, a ninny for too long now. Collins and Griffith are right. We got the best we could hope for. The bloodshed will have to stop now. For God's sake, don't dig yourself any deeper into this pit. Liam is of course right. The motion has been carried by four votes to three. I shall accordingly resign as head of this cabinet 
and inform the Doyle of my resignation as president. Give up this whole nonsense, Dev. This would not happen. Eamon, this is madness. We need to show your united front here. We will be the laughing stock of the world. Don't do this. Chief, I implore you as you implored me to go to London. Please do not go down I, this road. I have made up my mind, Michael. I will not be deflected on this. Ah, let him sulk away, Mick. I accept his resignation. Let him off. Let's move on. Yes, yes, this this cabinet is dissolved. Let the Doyle decide on the composition of a new cabinet and a new president. Excuse me, Chief, but we have not resigned and we will decide on what's to be done. So if you're quite finished, please be gone. You have no mandate, sir, to overlook the authority of the Doyle. This is preposterous, man. In the name of God, leave it, Dev. We can do no more here. Let's get out of here. I will go, then. Good riddance. My friends, my, my dear friends, we are in a crisis. The country is split down the middle on the question of this damnable treaty. If only my number two document could be put before the people, we could secure the Republic and stay within the British terms. I wonder if for it could God's be possible... For God's sake, Dev, give it a rest. The time for your legal and political niceties has long passed. We need to get to the people. They are our only hope. Our message is simple and clear. We stand for the Republic and not this lackey state that the English have foisted on us. And you, Chief, must go to the people. Your people. The press, the bishops, even the Pope are in their pockets. The British will side with the pro-treaty forces. The business and the money classes will want stability. They will side with Collins, Griffith and Cosgrove. But they can't hold a candle to you. Even your political enemies admit that you are the real and anointed leader of the Irish nation. The ordinary people are on our side. The army will stay loyal to the Republic. To you, you need to get out there, and among them, we will carry the day. This treaty is treason, and the dogs in the streets of all the little villages in Ireland know that. Yes, 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 but, but if we could only explore further my number two document, the concept of external association could break the deadlock. Forget it, Dev. The die is cast. That number two document with all its circles and tangents is typical of your academic mathematical mindset. Nobody bar you understands it. Listen, the message is simple. Brits out, no treaty, and up the Republic. That's what they want to hear, pure and simple. And and if the people opt for a different tune, what then, Carl? Well, Chief, it's war and no mistake. Leave that side of things to stack bowler than me. And what about me, my dear Cahill? Jesus, Countess, you're mad for action. Let's just see how the Prince here can conjure up his magic. We will surely win the day. And don't forget the women of Ireland have the vote now. Have you noticed? Mrs Pierce, Connolly's widow, the Plunkets and the rest are to a woman anti-treaty. Don't be a fool, woman. All you types have nothing to lose. Widows, sons lost, divorcees even. The ordinary woman of Ireland wants her sons, her brothers, her husband to come home and settle down at last. Do you think they want them cowering above in the hills? They want stability and prosperity and they listen to their priests. The truth is the clergy are pro-treaty and the women will come to heal. This is why they will listen to you, Dev. You are their lay cardinal. Come and Amman are totally with us. We have no choice. We will take to the hustings. Childers will draft my speeches. College Green, the Malincork, Collins's Heartland, Limerick, among my own and all the market squares in all the towns in Ireland. O'Connell's monster meetings are making a comeback. That's the spirit, Chief. Lads, the traitor Collins is beyond in Clannacilty. Says he's down for a tour of duty. Spreading Lloyd George's propaganda. Among his own people, he says. Who's with him, woman? The cocky bastard has Dalton and a few escorts. One armoured car and an outrider. We can easily take him. There's a flying canyon waiting for him at the bend in the road above Bailenham Law. They seem to be cornered going back and forth retracing their steps. They're all over the place. Well, Dev, this is the big one. It's your call. And what call would that be, Sean? Do we take him, Chief? We'll never get a chance like this again. Call it, Chief. Under no circumstances are you to assassinate Collins. It is unthinkable, man. Well, it's just what I'm thinking. The arrogance of him. Strutting about West Cork, prostituting that treasonous rag. Don't you see? He's testing us. If we let him go, he'll tell O'Higgins, O'Duffy, and the rest that the country is tamed. 
I didn't risk my neck and lose half my family in the war against the Tans to have that peacock piss it down the toilet. I say we take him and Dalton and his stooges and now chief today before he leaves West Cork. You don't realise what vengeance will be wreaked upon us. It's a bridge too far. Feck the bridge and feck the vengeance. We've gone past worrying about vengeance. I say we take him and live or die with the consequences. I'm with you, Sean. Let this is madness. I, I will not allow it. Yeah, well, you're a bit out of your area to be vetoing military decisions now, Chief. This is war, Dev, and you'd better get used to it. What would your pal Brewer say, huh? Feck Brewer! What would O'Donovan Rossa say? Don't you see, he, Collins, our Michael, is an agent of his Britannic Majesty. He took Churchill's 18-pounders and turned them on his own in the four courts. He started this mad war, Dev, and if we let him away, he will finish it. For we will take him today and you will be quiet. Your political niceties and constitutional protocols don't wash down here. We have suffered too much. Too many of us have been sacrificed for us to give up now. You do not understand the consequences of this decision. Let him go and I will sort him out. He is still willing to negotiate. That horse has well bolted, Dev. The barn door is wide open and he is eating grass in the front field. You walked out of the doyle. Did you not consider then the consequences? It's a bit late now to be climbing back up on the ditch. Anyway, Chief, you weren't too behind the door beyond that Mount Street Bridge in 16, hmm? How many foresters were killed? And on your orders, mind? Over a hundred, they say, Sean. Over a hundred, you say, huh? All in a day's work, Dev. This is different. They were the enemy man. Collins, Collins sir- and his lot are worse. They are in league with the enemy. If you think we are going to let him away after parading himself all over our backyard, you are mistaken. He is the enemy and we have him within our grasp. Anyway, Dev, leaving your mate Collins out of it for a minute, tell me this. What would you do if an enemy patrol car came within firing distance of our forces? Hmm? Would you give the orders to ambush? That's a a very different sort of... It's the same feckin' difference. That's it settled. Moira, tell the lads to remain with Bail and Law. Collins, I mean the enemy convoy, will have to pass there on their way back to Cork City. That's if they don't get lost again. Their orders are to ambush the convoy and bring any captives back here for interrogation. You got that, girl? Yes, sir. That all right by you, Chief? Do what you wish, man. You will do it your way anyway. (sighs) Always on the fence, Chief. Always on the fence. Let's stop at the next village, Emmett, for a drink, huh? I don't like to tempt fate, Mick. We're we're deep in enemy territory. I wish you fool. The people of West Cork have embraced us. I'm among my people. Did you not see their faces in Clannacilty and all the little villages? Don't be too sure, man. They might love you as their own, but mark this, they don't love that treaty. All is not as it seems. Look into their eyes. They want to embrace you, but in the quiet corners, the snugs and kitchens of West Cork, the truth escapes. They hate that document. They hate us. You saw the evidence with your own eyes, man. The blown up bridges, the barricades, the movement in the hills. We need to get back to Cork City before dark. We're sitting targets. Emmet, my friend. I am the Commander-in-Chief of the National Army and I will continue my tour of duty. I despise that desk job in the city. I need to get out into the country, man. Meet the real people. Why don't you leave the soldier into me, Mick? You've enough on your hands since we buried poor Arthur. You should have stayed in Dublin after the funeral. Damn it, man, you've enough on your plate as it is. Get yourself back to the big smoke tomorrow and start running this little country of ours. Not a chance. I have to cover the long fellow. As long as Dev roams the land peddling his irregular propaganda, I must confront him. Jesus, if only we'd get him on board. He could run this country blindfolded. That long fellow won't bend, man. Christ knows we've tried everything with him. Soft soap, plomos, reason, logic, the devil and all. There's really only one way to bring him to heel, and that's physical force. We need to win this nasty little war, and soon... Then we can begin running the country. I hear he's in the locality. What do you say we go and call on him for a chat, huh? Are you out of your mind, man? We're in enough danger as it is. Don't you see, Mick? You both have an arse weight. Devon yourself. Down here, you're one of their own, carrying the wrong message. 
But Dev, he's an alien here. But he has the right message, as far as the people are concerned. Sean, yep. uh, just go straight back to the Imperial Hotel in Cork. Don't stop at any of the villages or slow down, right? We need to get to the city before dark. Yes, sir. Jesus, I knew it! An ambush! Sean, drive on, man! Don't stop! Keep moving, man! An ambush, is it? Boy, Jesus, I'd give them a belly full of lead! Stop the car! I said stop the car in the name of God! We'll stand and fight! Come on down here, ye bunch of cowardly sea beans! So you want to shoot your own countrymen? Your own county men? Nick, in the name of Jesus, get back in the car! Which one of you wants to kill me? Show yourselves! Men, return fire! Look up there in the boreen! Nick, get back behind the car, man! You're a sitting duck! Get back behind the car, man! This is more like it, Emmett, my boy. The real stuff. Did Dev send us over here, or did he come himself? Which kitchen table is he hiding under? Hold your fire, men! Hold your fire! They're retreating! I said hold your fire! They're off over the hill! They're getting away! Come back, you shower of cowardly rats! And tell Dev he knows where he can find me! We'll be back and we'll flush you off the countryside forever! Tell that to your chief! Mick, let them go, man! Get back behind the car, for God's sake! Look, they're getting away! Come on! General Collins, sir, there's a sniper on the hill! Get back, sir! Jesus Christ, man, he's hit! Cover me, Sean! Don't go out there! I said cover me! Mick! Mick, son, stay with us! Stay with us, Mick! Uh, Emmett. Emmett. Oh, Jesus. Emmett. Mick, stay with us! Oh, oh my God, I'm hardly sorry for having offended thee. And I detest my sins above every other evil, because they displease thee, Emmett. my God, who for the infinite Emmett. goodness... I'm so deserving of all my He's gone, sir. He's gone, sir. He's gone.